So I'm really excited about today's conversation. I'm joined by two former stars of the channel, Ian McGillchrist and John Viveki. And you both have, I, I think, very, you're vo both very comprehensive thinkers. You both have a really interesting big picture take on the world, which I'm really looking forward to hearing you, you guys explore and compare notes. Ian, people may be familiar with, you wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary that was hugely influential. It looked at how the left and the right brain perceive the world differently and how that kind of, that difference cascades through culture and cascades through all of human knowledge and human history. And John, you've become kind of a, a cult hit in the last year or so with your series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which again is this very big picture appreciation of the kind of grand sweep of Western culture, where we're at and where this sort of meaning crisis that we're in, how we might start to look at getting out of it. So I hope I did justice to your, your, your both of your um, work there. But I'd love to ask you maybe in turn what you would like to uh, inquire, what you'd like to get out of this conversation and what you'd like to ask the other about their work. Maybe starting with you, John. What I'm interested in uh, talking with Ian about, um, uh, first, I think there's, uh, I do work on plausibility, so this interest may be a little bit uh, specific to me, um, but one of the things that uh, brings plausibility to a theoretical stance is when you have sort of independent convergence uh, on a position. Um, and I've only really very recently read, uh, I'm reading, in fact, I'm still reading Ian's book. Um, and so I came to uh, conclusions about uh, the hemispheres from doing the work I do on insight. Um, and it, it seems to me that they're deeply convergent uh, with the ends, especially the emphasis on attention and how the hemispheres should be thought as almost connoting uh, an entire sort of existential mode. And so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about um, that uh, because I use sort of some problem solving language to talk about it. Um, he used a slightly different language, but I think it's we're seeing the same thing. So I just want to quickly explore that um uh, uh, sort of set up a common ground and then what i'd like to talk to ian about are he says some tantalizing things about reason and rationality which are big topics for me right now uh because uh, as you guys know probably might know uh from the series and some of the work i'm doing i'm trying to expand the notion of rationality take it out of being located into sort of just logical inferential management um and expand the notion of rationality to try and once again reintegrate it with uh, wisdom. Um, and so the topics of rationality and wisdom, I'd like to uh, talk to Ian about um, the, the important roles, for example, that insight um, and implicit learning uh, perhaps play um, in rationality. Um, and, uh, and then the overlap with wisdom takes us into the topic that I'd spent, like to spend the bulk of the time talking to Ian about, uh, which is this idea of the meaning crisis um, and what I'd specifically like to do uh, is, and uh, this has to do more, I think, with the timing of Ian's book. Uh, so in the last 15 years, and I'm part of this, there's been a lot of psychological and cognitive scientific work on meaning in life and how that's different from like semantic meaning and what are the factors that drive meaning in life. And I thought it might be interesting to bring Ian's work and that cognitive science of meaning in life into a deeper discussion. So those are the things I thought uh, we could talk about. <laughs> well, that that certainly gives us um, enough to chew on for a few days, yeah. um, and I, <laughs> I'd be very keen to explore those things, and perhaps also what it means to know something and what it means to understand things. You know, mm. because these are words, you know, uh, bandy about, but they have uh, different meanings. In fact, I often think that one of the reasons so much Anglo-American philosophy goes off into what I consider a rather autistic and sort of left hemisphere dominated realm is because we don't, um, almost peculiarly al alone, have different words for different kinds of knowing. Mm. And, and that causes quite a lot of confusion. So I, I would certainly like to talk about all of that. Oh, I, I'd um, definitely like to talk about that, Ian, because uh, I'm doing a lot of work now. It's been through the series and I'm developing it more on the sort of four kinds of knowing. And as you say, you see in other cultures, they have different words for these different kinds of knowing. Um, yeah, and yeah. and, and I, I, we could perhaps touch on that because I think that plays a central role in the meeting crisis, the loss of the theoretical connection and to a significant degree, even the embodied lived connection 
with these other kinds of knowing other than the propositional knowing that is so prized yep. in Anglo-American culture. So I would like to really dig into that very deeply. Could you list right. those four ways of knowing, John, just so that we so can... The way, I talk about, the way I talk about it is uh, that there's propositional knowing, which is the one that is belief-centric, and, and propositional knowing is knowing that, and then you fill in a proposition, knowing that the cat is, an, is a mammal. And this, of course, is highly prized because it's the center of sort of inferential theory building. And, and we we've, we've tend to do assimilate everything to that. We even treat religious systems as if they are systems of belief. Um, even though there are yeah. some very good people out there like John Cars, James Cars, you know, the religious case against belief, saying that's a serious misrepresentation of what's going on in religion. Um, now, cognitive psychology and cognitive science have sorted, started to open up to the second P, which is uh, procedural knowing, which is knowing how to do something, like how to catch a baseball. And here the normativity isn't the conviction of truth. Right, which you have for propositional knowing. Here, the normativity is a sense of engagement and empowerment. Right, so it's the aptness, the fittedness of your skill, um, which is very different kind of normativity. Uh, skills aren't true or false; they are apt or well fitted or not. Um, then there's perspectival knowing. This is the knowing that you have because you are a conscious being. This is knowing what it's like to be here right now, the here nowness, what it's like to be sober, what it's like to be sane, what it's like to be awake, what it's like to be conscious, sort of my salience landscaping, how things are foregrounded, backgrounded, right? All that dynamic salience uh, and sizing up and how I'm getting sort of an optimal grip, uh, as Marlo Ponti talks about on a situation. So this is basically your situational awareness. And so the participatory knowing is it's the most backgrounded, but it's the deepest one. It's the one that uh, a lot of uh, post Heideggerians have been trying to bring into deeper awareness. It's this sense of attunement, fundamental connectedness, being at home. It's the sense, it's the sense you lose when you're in another culture, that the, you, your agency and the arena just aren't quite in sync the way they need to be. And so that is ultimately the, 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 the grounding, that, 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 that sort of co-identification process that's happening in participatory knowing. And so um, for me, two things that, that um, tie to what some of Ian's question, deep understanding is involves an alignment of these four kinds of knowing. Um, that's deep understanding. And uh, I think a lot of the meaning making machinery where meaning doesn't mean semantic content of your propositions, but it's your fundamental lived sense of how connected you are to yourself, to other people and to the world, ultimately takes place in these lower, the procedural, the perspectival, and ultimately the participatory kinds of knowing. And our culture has lost, deeply lost theoretical touch with them. And I think in many people's lives, they've lost a kind of lived existential touch with them. Sorry, that was a lot, but I tried, I need to cover quite a bit uh, as fast as no, possible. No, that, that's great. Um, it, there's just so many things that I'd love to pick up uh, in what you said. Um, and I, I perhaps start with the idea of what a belief is, which right. we consider to be the assent or, or not to um, a logical proposition of some kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the root of the word um, believe is in love, actually. It's in. Yeah, believe in. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, believe in. And um, it's, it's to do with a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's central to what you're talking about and what I'm talking about. Yes. Because truth can be thought about as correctness to an abstract idea that we have. Or it can be truth in the sense that a person can be true to another mm -hmm. person yes. or two surfaces that a carpenter makes are true to one another, which means that they meet Mm -hmm. and that there is some sort of coming together. So I would see the big fault line in knowledge to be between the I is and the I thou. Um, in the Masterman's Emissary, I suggest that the evolution of language very much strongly promoted a relationship of standing back in an I it, even though it began in the business of wanting to communicate. Mm. Um, and so um, as... Uh, John Archibald Wheeler said, I mean, it's, there are many, many confluences between physics and um, a decent philosophy. This is a participatory universe. Mm. Even at the hardest edges of physics, um, what is, as it were, we conceive out there and what is in here are not fully separable. 
Right. And it's not a question of our being put together with other people, but of uh, um, we're already together. It's just that we imagine the separations um, that are much less vivid than they seem to us in the way in which we think. So I think what is happening in the world we're in at the moment is a kind of disembedding, an mm -hmm. abstraction, a decontextualizing. And this is typical um, uh, of the way in which the left hemisphere thinks. It is very apt to construe a model that is internally consistent, but is not necessarily consistent with experience. Um, it would take too long, but I, it, I've written much more about it in the book that I'm just finishing this week, which has taken me about 10 years, um, to talk about this uh, business of uh, being decontextualized from the body, from the continuity of a culture, from the spiritual realm and all that is implied in that, and from togetherness with the natural world. All these things which are so important to a sense of meaning, our mm -hmm. lives have, have until just a few hundred years ago, for millions of years, they have been embedded in nature. And, you know, I hate the word the environment because it suggests that nature is something around you, but yeah. you're not in. We yeah. are nature. We come out of nature and we go back into nature. And there is no division there between us and it. It. I don't know. I hate that. It's like talking about God as it. I almost prefer to say she. But anyway. Um, so I think that what's happening is it's not surprising there's a crisis of meaning because meaning comes not of constructing a serial line of words, thoughts, and ideas that leads to a conclusion, very much the left hemisphere way of thinking, but emerges without our being able fully to understand how or to control the process out of our being embedded in, dwelling in, as Heidegger would have said, the world. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, we are now deracinated from, as I say, from our culture, from nature, from one another, and from the body. So much nowadays is so purely put across as abstract and cerebral. The way in which psychologists and neuroscientists talk about the brain is perhaps inevitably, but I think very damagingly couched in language entirely appropriate to a machine. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard, therefore, to stand back from all this talk of circuits and switches and um, replays and relays and so on to uh, the, the notion that the brain is actually an aspect of a person. So uh, I'll just put all that out for the moment. Oh, no, we'll that, 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 that's wonderfully rich, Ian. So um, I'm going to now speak as a representative of uh, a movement, I suppose you could call it, within cognitive science, because I, I clearly identify with this, which is called 4E cognitive science. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But this is the idea that we have to fundamentally break out of that sort of Cartesian model, both that the mind is locked inside the head, and it's a pure logic machine, and its primary operations are epistemic in nature. So, right, the fact that that has been given, the fact that that has just been translated into sort of materialist view is still radically uh, uh, insufficient. Um, so what 4E cognitive science emphasizes is the ease that cogni cog we have to see cognition as inherently constitutively embodied. We have to see cognition, the next E, as inherently constitutively embedded. We are, it is the way in which we are coupled to the environment, the, the dynamic coupling, the mutual unfoldment of cognition and environment in which we should understand cognition. Um, that it, it is extended, that cogn cognition isn't in the head, especially distributed cognition, that most of our cognition, our problem solving is done in concert with other people, networked together. So there's deep interpenetration between culture and cognition. And then uh, finally enacted, that cog cognition isn't primarily about argumentation. It's something that we do by basically evolving the sentry motor loop on a step-by-step -step basis. And that's where, in fact, I do a lot of my work. And so a lot of this work, I think, is actually deeply consonant uh, with the criticism you make of what is still, I, I agree with you, it's still sort of the paradigmatic way 
in which that, that Cartesian paradigmatic way in which we see uh, people investigating cognition. But um, to maybe give you some hope, is that what I'm trying to do? Um, for e cognitive science is a big deal and it is becoming, it is growing in prominence and importance. Um, it has, uh, uh, you know, we, we've just released, you know, there it is. The Oxford Handbook of 4E cog Cognitive Science, right? Uh, so 4E Cognition. Uh, so there's a lot that's happening now that I think uh, has two things behind it. One, I think, is a bona fide uh, scientific academic realization um, of important aspects of the functionality and phenomenology of cognition and consciousness that cannot be addressed adequately within that Cartesian framework. So I think there's a genuine philosophical scientific body of argumentation that is just pushing us out of that. And it's been deeply influenced by, you know, Heidegger, uh, the neo Heideggerians. But I think also, and this is something I argue in my series, I think this turn isn't just purely epistemically driven. It's not just because people are trying to solve problems. I think there's a big cultural motive uh, behind this, that, that many of these people, myself included, we are practitioners uh, of various kinds of, you know, uh, ecologies of practices like I do, uh, you know, various kinds of mindfulness and Tai Chi and stuff like that, because, right, we're trying to see if we can reunite, if you'll allow me a bit of a slogan here, the science and the spirituality back together again. That's, I think, uh, what's really happening right now in a very deep way. Well, uh, you know, I like all of that. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm very much on side with that. Mm. There is nonetheless a tendency at a meta level for, for that to become itself a rather disembodied theory rather yeah, than yeah, yeah, something yeah. practical. So I like the emphasis on praxis and on movement. Yeah. Uh, one of the themes, I mean, my latest book, which will be called The Matter with Things, um, which is a pun on several levels. Mm -hmm. um, it, it could have been pretty much called Everything Flows because yeah. we tend to see the world as a series of snapshots or elements or slices that are put together um, as our conscious cognition puts ideas together rather than those slices or or, or, or snapshots being, if you like, illicitly extracted from what is an, an always seamless flowing process. So you've probably seen Tversky's recent book on the same thing, uh, Mind and Motion. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you Ian, about some of my most recent work because it just goes directly to what you just what you just said. You know, trying to get past this snapshot uh, version of reality. Uh, so myself and Dan Chiappi were doing work on how the scientists, the NASA scientists on Earth make use of the rovers on Mars. The, you know, the rovers that are exploring. And what they get is they get back snapshot pictures. That's all they get. And they don't have the control of the rover, right? And so they can't actually do the science with those snapshots. What, what they look for is somebody who can do this, and I'll talk about it in a sec, they do these sort of tricks with their mind so that they can get a sense of actually being on Mars. And the person right. who can go from the snapshot to the being on Mars, they look for the scientists that can do that because those are the people that can actually do, use the rovers well to do uh, the, the yeah. science on Mars. And what's really interesting, they want that sense of presence, that perspectival knowing. And so what they do is you can see them and, and they just do it spontaneously. They generate that participatory knowing. They, first of all, they anthropomize the, the, the rovers. Instead of saying the rover should go here, they say, I should go there. And, the, and, and we, we should go there, right? And oh no, I'm stuck here, right? And, but they also technomorphize themselves. They'll do things like, they'll, they'll, uh, like they'll say, uh, uh, they'll put a phone on a desk and say, there's the rock and they'll go like this for the cameras. And I need to do this, I need to. And they swivel and move their body around, right? And what they do is they, they get this, right? This loop of their sort of shaping, their anthropomorphizing the rover and roverizing themselves, if you'll allow me, and they create this participatory bond. And you know what's really, really interesting, Ian, is they'll say things like this. These are these hard-nosed, left hemispheric, rational theory builders. They'll say things like, you know, I was working in the garden and my right wrist got sort of stuck. And when I got to the lab, the rover's right wheel was stuck.
<laughs> and, and they'll even say, I don't know what's going on, but there's some kind of connection. They basically have to build the perspectival and participatory knowing before they can do any of that sophisticated theorizing. And that puts me in mind, as I'm sure it does you, of how a skilled tracker um, puts himself into yep. the frame of the animal yep, that is tracking, so oh, yeah. he can see what it's seeing and be know where it's going. So yes. uh, I think that is that is wonderful. Um, to get back though to um, well, let me just give you some idea of. Of, of what I've been writing about, if I may, oh, yeah. um, because it's very fresh in, in my mind at the moment. Um, I, I can deal with the, the first part of the book very briefly. I basically look at the ways in which we garner knowledge of the world mm -hmm. all the time, and the main conduits through that can happen, which, through which that can happen, namely attention, perception, the judgments that are bound up with perception, um, cognitive intelligence, and social and emotional intelligence. Those are the ways in which we can sort of get information, knowledge about the world. And to cut a very long story short, in a sentence, each of these, I compare the role of the right and the left hemisphere. And what comes out is that the, the left hemisphere is more, uh, is less good at all these things. It's, it's more, sitting in a place where once the right hemisphere has dealt with experience, it can take it away and do procedures right. on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then yeah, in yeah. the second part of the book, I look at what I would call the four routes to understanding, which are a more long-term process, whereby we try to make sense of what it is we, we know through those, those modes I've just described. And I believe they are science, reason, and I, I would distinguish between reason and rationality here, um, intuition and imagination. Mm. And my conclusion, again, very briefly, is that we need each of these in almost every case to be applied to what we're looking at. There are some exceptions. But in reality, what's happening is that we're using only one or perhaps two of these modalities in approaching any subject in order to understand it. And what's more, we're relying most on the parts that the left hemisphere contributes, which are less valuable than the parts that the right hemisphere contributes, including to science and reason. The myth that somehow science is all left hemispheric or that yeah. reason is yeah. completely wrong. Yeah. And then in the last part of the book, I look at the building blocks of the cosmos. Uh, <laughs> time, space, <laughs> motion, yeah. consciousness, matter, yeah. um, value uh and the divine and and a coincidence of opposites is my last chapter which is a very strong theme in the whole book and really what i'm suggesting is we misunderstand the world because we're using only a tiny fraction mm -hmm. of what we could have been doing and knowing largely because we've got locked into this fantastically restrictive reductive mechanistic very simple way of thinking about the world in which it's modeled on a machine. And, you know, it's just not like that. I don't know. What, there's so much I want to respond to on that. Um, so I do something very similar. I'm getting sort of really surprised about how convergent uh, our work is. Um, so I, where I start as a scientist is I start with um, uh, the central problem of attention. Um, which is the, the issue I call, which is the issue of relevance realization, which is of, of all of the information available to you, what do you zero in on as relevant? How do you make it salient? Um, uh, out of all the information available to you in long-term memory, what do you access and how do you, how do you shape it? Um, of all of the possible combinations of things you could do, all the courses of action, all of these search spaces are combinatorial explosive and they all, right, and, and they all require an amazing ability, uh, which, which is the thing that we're finding most difficult to give to artificial intelligence, which is exactly this ability of somehow not searching the whole space, because that would take uh, way too much time. Somehow you intelligently ignore, which sounds like a Zen Cohen, you intelligently ignore most of that information and reliably, nowhere perfectly, because you can't, nobody can be perfect on this. And that'll bring me back mm -hmm. to something I want to talk about. 
you zero, you reliably zero in on relevant information. Now that tells me right, right from the beginning, this is the point I wanted to come back to, that cognition and knowledge should not be held prey to logical standards of certainty because that is not actually cognitively possible. If you try to logic your way through all of this information processing, you would commit cognitive suicide. In fact, most of your cognition, right, um, can't operate that way. So this for me carries a deep epistemological uh, implication, which is we have to give up and, and think about how deeply entrenched, and you probably say this is a left hemispheric thing, I think, uh, given some of the, our email exchange, we have to give up the standard of certainty uh, in, uh, you know, a, 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 as how we evaluate truth and perfection is how we understand goodness. I think those two standards have held us prey um, in a, a really disastrous way. And so part of what I've been trying to do then is, okay, once we, we make this, is we have to understand that this relevance realization machinery is happening pre-inferentially. Before I can make any categories, I have to be able to zero in, right? So we, so I call this 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 ability to be coupled to the world. And relevance is transjective. This is relevance is not a property of this, right? It's not a, it's not just a subjective thing. It's an affordance between. It's a real relation between me. So this is I call this religio. It's the sense of deep binding, and I'm alluding to one of the etymological potential etymological origins of religion, right? And I, I see a lot of practice that people have dismissed as, ir is, as irrational as practices that are designed to activate and accentuate this sense of religio. Sure. So where that takes me to is, and, and, and I, I want to pick up on two points in your book that I think are relevant, is back to, and maybe you're using reason how I use rationality, and may, we may just have a semantic thing. Because I think the core of what I call rationality is not inferential manipulation of propositions, right? Uh, because that's ultimately this logical thing that's I think has put it's a, it's it's put us in the wrong model of how we're trying to get knowledge. Because I think what rationality is ultimately about is this idea: the very processes that of our intelligence that are doing this relevance realization are also the processes that can they can misfire, and they can make the wrong thing salient to us in the wrong way. And I think that is sort of the key of self-deception. And you've pointed out two things that I want to bring it back into what I'm calling rationality, perhaps what you mean by reason. You noted how, you know, the right hemisphere is very good at looking for when it has, when, where, there, where there's anomalies or where things are going wrong. Whereas the left hemisphere is this sort of, no, no, things are right, stick to the formal system, right? And so, the right hemisphere would play a very deep role in overcoming self-deception. And where that, I think we've got experimental evidence for that is the following. As you note in your book, I think correctly, in insight, we overcome a, a misframing. And what we do is we go into the right hemisphere. We don't try and solve the problem anymore. We actually try to change the framing of the problem. And then we come back. And it's increasingly looking like the machinery by which we gain insight is also the machinery by which we overcome self-deception. So self-deception seems to be this breaking out of inappropriate framing. And that means that there's a lot more things that are central to what I'm calling rationality than argumentation. The, all of the things we need to do, all of the practices we need to gauge in so that we can systematically call our self-deception into real question and, and, and also to aspire to truly transforming in the face of that challenge, I, that's what I want to pack back into the notion of rationality. Because at the heart of it, even at the heart of science, the scientific, science isn't about the sets of propositions it collects, it's about a self-correcting process that's designed to try and help us overcome the way we're self-deceptive. That's what should be made, that should be made the keystone of what I think we're talking about when we're talking about being reasonable or being or pursuing rationality. So that, that's that's what I want. I, that's what I want to bring to bear because I think there's deep connections between a reformulation of rationality, a, a rediscussion of the kinds of knowing, and then the, what you're talking about about these kinds of projects of knowledge acquisition, if I can put it that way. I think there's they need to talk to each other very deeply. Wow, and there's nothing for it. We just have to have 
many more of these conversations. <laughs> um, I, don't know where, I don't know which to go to first. There are so many things I want to, to uh, pick up on. First of all, certainty. Certainty doesn't exist. Certainty is just one of those fictions. Mm -hmm. um, it would depend on the idea of truth being, as it were, a thing out there that we can grasp. Yeah, yeah. Whereas truth is this coming together of things, which is yeah. always a matter of negotiation. So we negotiate with reality and we change the gestalt that yeah. we see. We don't add another thing to a line we're pursuing. Instead, we shift the gestalt, the whole picture, and then we see more. And what a truer gestalt is, is simply one that explains more than the one we've just yep. jettisoned was able to. In fact, when I, when I was in my 20s, I wrote a book about um, literary criticism, which was in, in the end called Against Criticism. But I thought of calling it Against Perfection, because it seemed mm. to me that the problem with so much of the way we philosophize about everything, including the arts, is to have abstract ideas that we want it to uh, approximate to, rather than seeing the thing as having an individuality, which we couldn't have foreseen, and we couldn't have predicted, and which gives something to the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm absolutely with you on that. Um, on self-deception, um, well, uh, as I say in the book and in that book, <laughs> and I say more about it in the book I've just finished, um, the left hemisphere is a master of self-deception. I mean, except that it's not in a master of it because it doesn't know it's even doing it, but it is capable of deceiving us in the most extraordinarily um, gross way. Mm. Uh, and you see this in, in you know, hard neurological cases yeah, yeah, where yeah. people will deny the most obvious realities because they don't have insight. And we yeah. know that when patients who've lost insight because of an illness start to get insight into their illness, this is because bits in the right frontal cortex yeah, that were yeah. closed down start yeah. to open up. Yeah, totally. So the left hemisphere is quite capable of getting further and further into a thing it believes to be right and the only way to free it up is for the right hemisphere to be able to intervene and say, hang mm. on, hang on. You know, Ramachandran calls it the um, a devil's advocate because it's mm. the one that detects the problem. So, yes, I think we can be very self-deceived. And one of the interesting things is that, you know, of course, the work of uh, uh, Dunning and Kruger, the Dunning Kruger yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just for the sake of the audience, I'll just say the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is an observation that the people who are doing worst at a subject and don't really understand it, think they know it all and have a gross overestimate of what it is they yeah, know, yeah. whereas the people who really know rather doubt themselves. Yeah, yeah. The observations in follow-up experiments um, after the initial experiment um, set of experiments showed that when they had got a rational schema for how to approach something, they were more and more confident that it was right, even if yeah. the model was blatantly wrong. So yeah, I think yeah. all that's very relevant to the way in which we, yeah. so many of the things we get passionate about are to do with a very simple theory or model about how the world should be, but not about how from experience uh, the world is. And I suppose the thing that's most important out of what you said, at least for, for, for your, your, as I understand your concerns, is about reason. And I, I'm making a distinction between rational, we don't have this proper distinction in English, but in other languages like Greek and Latin and German, there are distinctions between kinds yep. of understanding. Yep. But we, as again, we don't distinguish different kinds of knowing, we don't distinguish different kinds of understanding. Yes. But one is an understanding which is purely schematic, the kind of thing that a computer equipped with an excellent lexicon and um, the rules of syntax would be able to do. Right. Whereas there is a kind of reason that doesn't in any sense, um, uh, uh, what shall I say, deny that, but combines it with the uh, precognitive, implicit, intuitive sense of things that you were describing, mm -hmm. in which 99% of our knowledge actually resides yes. with that schema and the way in which it is employed. Yeah. And in a way, it's like the difference between 
um, you know, putting a lot of data into a computer and allowing the computer to decide what's going on. The data are selected by you before you put them in. And when they come out, they're interpreted by you. The computer just does the processing. And that's slightly like a model of the way in which the right and the left hemispheres understand one another, or the right hemisphere understands the left at any rate, because I don't think the left understands the right. But it, it brings knowledge information from experience, which the left hemisphere then can carry out procedures on internally, and then gives that back to the right hemisphere, which must then reintegrate that with everything else, <laughs> with the whole of experience to make sense of it. So I think those are important distinctions. And I think that rationality, trying to be reasonable, trying to be objective, it's better to call it a willingness to look at things from as many points of view as possible yeah. and assess which ones fit best, yeah, rather I than to follow a line and say, well, my line of reasoning leads there. Because, yeah. you know, if your line of reasoning leads to a dead end, don't go down it. Go back and try another part. Yeah. So two things come to mind immediately when you said that, um, and they converge in this, the, the, the current work I'm working on and the series I'm working on, um, which is uh, people are talking about dialogical reasoning. Um, and the mm -hmm. idea here is that we're, and, you know, we're typifying it, we're exemplifying it right now. When you, when, uh, so, and uh, um, uh, Sperber has a new book on it, I forget who the co-author is, on the Enigma reason. And lots of people are now talking about this and something I'm exploring very deeply. Um, that we lost something when we moved with Aristotle to the monologue treatise. And when we, we, we lost something that we, when we had what was that was being exemplified in, in the Platonic dialogues. I know you have criticism, yep. Plato, but there is something I want to point to here of value. Um, the idea that, like, because when we're in dialogue, all of the kinds of knowing are at play. Right, and it's not just the propositional knowing. We're doing all like you're nodding, and I'm gesturing, and there's all we're trying to engage all of the kinds of knowing. And as you just said, we have multiple perspectives, and we can actually, you know, I, I think what that means, and when when you do some practices like I've done, like uh, the circling practice or uh, other things like that, what you what you get is this tremendous sense of being able to access something, a third factor that a place you can't get to on your own in your own cognition and you get you get this right you get this comprehensive sense moline in fact argues and i think pretty convincingly in his book that uh you know when plato's using the word epistemy where we get epistemic from it should not be translated as knowledge in fact most of the time what plato's actually talking about is understanding where understanding means exactly this what you know what kind of uh, dynamic convergence and then restructuring can we get out of these multiple perspectives coming into dialogue with each other. So I think, I, I think, um, while well, I'm making a claim, I guess, I think what the, the emergence on the internet of these dialogical forums like this, like rebel wisdom, and the increasing sense, the, 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 the beginning of what I see is a reflective sense is people keep asking, what is it we're doing here? What is it we're actually doing here? I think this is also part of a cultural response to the meaning crisis, that we're starting to do all of this because we're trying to figure out, we're trying to feel our way back to a dialogical way of reasoning rather than a monologic uh, way of reasoning. And I think this is an important turn. And I want to be, I, I, I want to help as a scientist, uh, you know, bring clarification uh, to this, uh, but uh, also as a practitioner, because I also do participant observation, I involved with trying to help set up communities also, but to try and actually engender and further this process uh, greatly. Well, I, look, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I, except perhaps a little bit about epistemia, but I don't want to get into <laughs> yeah. what my, okay. <laughs> but um, I think Plato did, Socrates a great disservice <laughs> by writing the dialogues down, except, of course, if he had, we wouldn't know anything about Plato. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, about Socrates. but Socrates actually, you know, didn't want these things to be done on paper or, as it were, written at all. Um, instead, it had to be a live uh, meeting of minds. In, what, in the seventh epistle, he talks yeah. about this spark that the spark leaps across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. Online. But I think, you know, there is richness to... The, 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 the many words that there are in Greek for kinds of knowledge, uh, not just epistemia, but particularly phronesis, 
which yeah. is a much more embodied, pragmatic yeah. understanding, yeah. which yeah. takes what everyone is intellectualizing about back into the world. And of course, techne, but, but Sophia, wisdom, I mean, from which we get philosophy, was a word that fantastically applied from everything from, you know, yeah. a philosopher down to a shipwright. So Homer talks about ships being built by the Sophia of the yeah. shipbuilder. Yeah. And um, uh, Theocritus talks about um, a, a piece of cloth being woven yeah. by the Sophia of the weaver. So I really love that because, again, we're getting back to this embodied sense of inhabiting the world um, which is just not what we're doing very much of the time these days. I think so. I think so. I think, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I teach a course on the psychology of wisdom and I do work on exactly this kind of stuff. Um, and about the relationship between Sophia, phronesis, also noose, because noose plays an important uh, bridging yeah. role between them. You can see that clearly uh, in Plato and in, and especially clearly in Aristotle. I would also say that um, I think we, we have, we have, a, a, I wouldn't want, I, I don't want to dismiss your criticism, uh, 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 Plato writing things down. I think you're right. And what I want to say is that that criticism, of course, was made in the ancient world. Um, Antisthenes, of course, made it. And then we get the cynics and the stoic tradition coming out of that. And what's interesting is stoicism, especially cynicism and stoicism, they put much more emphasis I mean, Epictetus is all about, don't tell me what you're talking about, show me how you're transforming your life, right? And so I think one, one of the things I want to do in this series is, can we take sort of uh, the Platonic dialogues, but can we take the Stoic practices? And Stoicism is going through a huge revival right now, again, not coincidentally. And I think we could put them, if you'll allow me the pun, we can put the Stoic developments, right, and the Neoplatonic developments back into dialogue and get back a, a better sense of what this Socratic practice looked like. So that's part of what I'm actually currently working on. Well, that's great, um, and I love that. And it, it occurred to me while you were talking that actually we are exemplifying at this moment the possibility of philosophy that isn't being written down. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it would be even better if we were in the same room, um, oh because God. I think there's something that happens when you're together with somebody. But, you know, there it is. Um, yeah. What I would like to throw into that is that all my life, really ever since I first discovered the pre-Socratic philosophers, mm. I thought the greatest philosophy is in the pre-Socratic era. Mm. And this mm. bloody Plato comes along with this clod hopping who <laughs> <laughs> tries to make it all so pedestrian and rules out the possibility, or seems to, certainly Aristotle did, that actually a thing in its opposite can equally be true. Now, to me, that is the idea that nothing is certain, it's all changing and interconnected, and that opposites flow mm. together. And that, you know, not seeing that is a huge problem for modern culture. We yeah. need to get back to the pre-Socratics, not just back to Plato, Aristotle, and all that. Because one of the things that, in a way, we don't appreciate the dark side of what we do. We live in an enlightenment or post-enlightenment culture, yeah. 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 children of the enlightenment, which believes that everything can be made uh, coherent with everything else, that it, it all fits into a nice logical picture. It, it's what Jung called the shadow or the dark side, yeah, that yeah. to everything that appears good, there is a price to be paid in something dark. And yeah. everything that is bad has its possible redemption within it. And there's nothing so good that more and more and more of it is just better and nothing so bad that just a little bit of it might not help. Now that perception, if only we could just get as far as acknowledging that things are not cut and dried, not black and white, that there is, Obama recently said, you know, ambiguous. Well, that would really be a very good, <laughs> a good place to be. <laughs> uh, so um, two things about that. Um, I've been practicing very many Taoist practices uh, now oh. for, for, for 29 years. And yep, so yep. Taoism is very much about that. Uh, and it's it about... Is the dynamic interpenetration. Um, I see that, I see in, in the later, especially when Neoplatonism integrates with aspects of Christianity in the work of people like Erigena 
and his notion of dialectic. I see something very similar to what you're talking about. And so uh, the fact that he was sort of ostracized and then later declared a heretic shows you uh, that it did not come foregrounded, but nevertheless, that there, there's definite, I think there's definite elements, especially towards uh, the uh, later Neoplatonism, uh, where you see something much more like what you're talking about. Um, and that yeah. a, a useful discussion between that and Taoism has been very possible for me in my life. Um, yeah. And so I'm hoping, I'm, I'm trying to share that with people at large because I think that kind of pluralistic dialogue um, is also needed right now. Um, so, yeah. So not just bringing multiple individual perspectives into dialogue, but bringing multiple cultural perspectives, wisdom traditions into deep dialogue yeah. uh, with each other, I think is also needed. Fantastic. And I, I've just been, <laughs> they cost me more in terms of blood, sweat, toil and tears than anything else I've ever written. Um, a couple of chapters about the divine. Um, ah. and, oh, yes. and Let's talk about when that. I first met when I first met Rowan Williams, who you know is a theologian, who was our Archbishop of Canterbury, um, and after writing the book, he, you know, we we met and talked, um, and he said, "What what are you thinking of writing about?" And I said, "Well, if I have enough hubris, I'm thinking of writing a short book about God." And he looked at me, and he just went, "Good luck," <laughs> and I wish I, <laughs> I wish I'd listened to him because. Anyway, they caused me a lot of grief. But in those chapters, what I was trying to do was show that there are strands in Taoism and Zen Buddhism in particular, but also in Hinduism and in the Western mystical tradition, particularly, yep. of course, Meister Eckhart and yes. Jacob Burma. Meister Eckhart, again, condemned as a heretic. Um, and only probably got away with it by dying in the nick of time. But I mean, all these people um, were exemplifying this kind of knowledge and understanding that I think we're trying to get towards. And wow. it's so present in modern physics. So I have, you know, curiously, I have this band of physicists who read my work and write to me and say, this is just exactly on what we're, we're confronting and writing about ourselves. So that's very um, encouraging to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, th this is th this is thrilling for me. First of all, I want to, I don't know if you read John Spencer's book, The Eternal Law, because he talks about um, how right at the beginning of the 20th century, many of these figures were actually deeply influenced by uh, the Neoplatonic mystical tradition or Vedanta in, in various ways. Um, and so he goes through that and shows how very deeply philosophical in the ancient sense of, philo sense of philosophy, li life transformative yeah. wisdom, these physicists yeah. were, how deeply embedded uh, and enmeshed they were in it. But uh, you, sh you should also know that, I mean, the core, I think, or maybe the apex, I don't know, the culmination, I, I don't know what the right noun is here. So, uh, um, but I mean, I try to talk about this idea of religio and then how, what, what, ha what happens when we get an experience of sacredness, when that religio becomes something that we regard as sacred and then, right, and then what is that, what is that putting us into relationship with, right, because you're, cor you're cor correct, saying that we grasp it is exactly not what does not happen um, in mystical experiences. I just ran an experiment in my lab uh, where we did a big MTurk survey on people who've had mystical experience and it's predictive of enhanced meaning in life. That's no surprise to you, but it's empirical evidence, right? But what's, what you might not know, but you, I, you probably suspect is what we have evidence. It's not the particular propositions people come out of these experiences with, it's the insight, it's the process of transformation, right? And what happens is they get, they get a sense of the really real and then they, get, they enter into this aspirational project of trying to conform themselves because they wanna stay in touch with the, the really real and that, What's going on there? I've been doing a, a lot of work on that. And, and what's, what's really interesting is that has led me into a lot of these kinds of discussions, Ian, with people that are coming out of the Christian tradition. And, right, and, so, and, and so there's been this long discussion we've been having, very fruitful, mutually respectful, genuine Socratic dialogue, in my mind, about sort of theism and non-theism and getting into a deeper discussion about that. And I've been trying to present non-theism as something that's trying to break the stranglehold 
the shared presuppositions of both atheism and theism, that it's about belief, that it's about a supreme being, right, that we, right, and all this, and that that, that, that that framing that locks us into the debate is actually the deeper problem, and trying to get one side to win over the other is actually contributing to the meaning crisis rather than resolving it. Well, absolutely, and I would say, you know, that the big divide is not actually between um, sort of believers and atheists, but between uh, dogmatic fundamentalists, either yeah, atheists yeah. or, or yeah, believers, yeah. with their codes and their I'm right and all the rest, and those who have a genuine openness, because if you have that genuine openness, you can't be dogmatic, because the more you understand, the more you understand what you don't understand. You know, it's it's the yeah. whole thing of Nicholas Cusa, uh, De Doctor yeah. Ignorantia, about learned yeah. ignorance. Yeah. The, the yeah. further you advance into knowledge, the less you know. And I, I but the more you can be connected, though. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I, sorry, it was just a, a spasm of agreement. I just said you, you may know less, but Nicholas of Cusa emphasizes you get connected more. You come into greater conformity with God, even though you're knowing less. I just, I did, I just wanted to say that, right? Um, I completely learned, agree with that. Because learned ignorance can can strike people the wrong way. They can hear it the wrong way. I, sorry, oh, yes. but I thought that was important. Well, no, 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 but no, but you make a very good point, which is that there is there is knowing, there is not knowing, and then there's a kind of unknowing that is the great achievement afterwards, which comes. Yes. It's not like ignorance in the first instance, and it's the same thing as. Um, innocence, you know, a child is innocent. We lose our innocence, but a saint regains a kind of innocence, the yeah. far side of experience. So I would say it's on the far side uh, of that. And that, in fact, when you were talking about rationality and people worrying about things being irrational, you know, I was just thinking about a very simple point, but we need to instate a word supra-rational, which is that it's not irrational. It's not, a, you know, just knowing what's rational and going against it for the sake of it, or because you can't see that. But it's acknowledging that something lies in a realm which reason simply cannot reach. It can get so far and then it can't go any further. So exactly. to, to have that knowledge is really important. And what, what I just wanted to add is that, because I, I, I didn't mention this, but the... The Kabbalah, the, the Jewish Kabbalah, uh, is something that has transformed my life in the last few years. Um, I'm, of course, not Jewish by, you know, <laughs> by origin, but I got to know about it, and it has rung so many bells with what I believe I've seen in the neuropsychology literature about the relationship between the hemispheres. I won't go into all that now, but, you know, I've written about it. Yeah. Thank, that's, I think that's fantastic. I mean... You do know, uh, I'm sure that there's deep historical confluences between the Neoplatonic tradition and Kabbalah. I mean, Bruce Lewis talks Absolutely. about that uh, in great length. And I was going to point to that term that I invoked earlier, because in the Neoplatonic tradition, you, uh, you eventually get, you know, to noose, and then, which is beyond discursive, uh, inferential yeah. reasoning, which is, which is a state of increasing conformity to the real, which isn't the same thing as asserting propositions about the real. And then, of course, you... No, no. Right, right. It's the opposite. Yes, yeah. exactly. It, it, because the, origin, that. the origin of noes is in noticing, right? Um, that's yeah. uh, you, you see it used in Homer. Noesis means sort of noticing, getting that sense of what's salient. Or, it's zeroing in my terms. It's zeroing in on what's relevant, so that you're coupled to it appropriately, so that you can engage in the relevant action and behavior. And so it's all about this coupling and this 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 participatory knowing, this mutual shaping and conformity. And noesis, I think, is the perspectival realization, and I mean both senses of the word realization, coming to awareness yeah, yeah. and actualizing reality. That's what I think noesis uh, is pointing to. And I think uh, the Neoplatonic tradition, I think, did a big corrective to the earlier Plato by bringing no noesis, a noose, um, into prominence in talking about how you actually how you actually cultivate wisdom and how you alleviate the senses of separation and disconnection, because they really, I have criticisms of the Neoplatonic tradition. I'm not trying to valorize them unconditionally, but the way they, right. they point towards news and the way they point to the issue of separation and disconnection being the source of our existential suffering, I think these were deep correctives, deep correctives. Yeah, I mean, having said that, uh, I, I'm sure you wouldn't uh, 
well, I don't know whether you would think I'm wrong or not, but <laughs> but what, what, what I think is so important is not to throw away the baby with the bathwater. There's a tendency to oh, move yeah. Yeah. between one polarity of everything is one. You know, when people say all is one and they're very profound, yeah. you know, yeah. I go, yeah, that's terribly profound, but hey, all is two. Now what? <laughs> and <laughs> all is many. So there, there needs to be the union of union and division, not just union or division. Okay. And so, but in any case, what I wanted to come back to was noticing. I love the thing about noticing. And of course, it's something we don't do much of nowadays, partly because yeah. we're living so much in the head. We're in so much of a hurry and we don't stop and stare enough. But when mm -hmm. you do and train yourself to see things, you notice so much more and mm -hmm. you start to feel the relationship with what it is you're noticing. Now, I have a strong belief that it's not that reality is made up by us, but no. it's not that reality just independently exists no. from us. We midwife reality into being. Yes. Our, our, yeah. our consciousness, which is never completely separate from the consciousness of what we're looking at, brings out an aspect of something. And so we are actually not just passive observers or recipients in the cosmos, we are actors in the cosmos in bringing the cosmos into being. I want to respond to that very deeply. Uh, first of all, I agree. I think part of the straitjacket I try to get out of in the series is the, uh, the, you know, the Lockean empiricism that the mind is tabula rasa and the Rousseauian uh, romanticism that the world is a blank, a blank canvas upon which we paint our subjectivity. I think those are both wrong. And so uh, I, that's why I've coined this phrase transjectivity, about trying to break out of the subjectivity, objectivity, uh, polarization of our epistemologies. I think that's a deep mistake. Absolutely. And, and so I think um, that notice that that idea, um, so, uh, this will sound like a slight digression, but uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Mark Lewis, um, He's doing some of the premier work on addiction right now. And he's trying to replace the disease model of addiction, which does not, is not well supported by a lot of the data. It's well funded by governments, but it's not well supported by data with a learning model. Um, and the, he calls it reciprocal narrowing. So it goes like this. Let's say I get slightly drunk. I lose some cognitive flexibility. And so I can't notice as many options in the world. So the world starts to narrow a bit. I then internalize this, which then narrows, and you get this reciprocal narrowing until you can't notice any alternatives and you can't notice any way in which you could be other than you are. And then you're the addict, you're trapped, right? And I think that's all right. Um, I, I think that's, in fact, I think it's a brilliant account of addiction. It, it, it supports much more of the empirical data. When I had lunch with Mark, I said to him, and this is where I brought in the Neoplatonic tradition, I said, but Mark, if there's reciprocal narrowing, there must be reciprocal opening. And he went, oh, you're right. And I said that, you know, and I think this is, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the anagogue, that what we can do is we can put ourselves into that, you called it that openness in which, right? And I think this is part of what, what I see Guy Sensok was circling, how he's trying to enact Heidegger, Heidegger's Aletheia, right? Is this reciprocal opening, right? And so, and, 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 and the work by Aaron and other shows, that's how you fall in love with something. Like if you disclose something and then I disclose and we do that reciprocal opening where I open up what I can be for you and that leads you to open up what you can be for me and then we reciprocally open, we fall in love with each other. And so, right, and, and that, that, I think that anagogic process, right, that reciprocal opening, um, you can see it in flow states and, right, that's, that, that, that's one way of trying to get this notion of noticing and dialogue, the dialogical relationship into, you know, we, we can connect it with practices that we're engaged in. And so I, 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 it leads me to, I mean, I, I hesitate to say this because it sounds like a Hallmark card, but I mean, I see part of the project, uh, you know, of, of, of reuniting rationality in this way with love so that we learn to fall in love with reality again in a deep and profound wow. way. That's fantastic. Um, you may know that, uh, or, or not, that I have a particular affection for the philosophy of Max Scheler, mm. you know, who not much read uh, in the Anglo world, but um, 
And he called humans, human beings, ends amans, the being that loves. Yeah. And this is the bit that was left out of Heidegger. He was a younger uh, contemporary of Heidegger. Heidegger thought that Scheler was the most important philosopher of the age, um, as he said at Scheler's funeral when, when he gave the oration. But the idea in Scheler is not that love arises out of acquiring knowledge, but that knowledge arises out of a disposition of love. Yeah. So you need, as it were, to be open to something before yeah. you can actually understand it. If you wait to know enough to open, then you've missed it. And yeah. I think this is an idea also in Pascal, so it's not so okay, yeah, mad, yeah, and, yeah. and it's also in Goethe. So all of these people saw that somehow our knowledge depends on a, on a loop of reciprocation yeah. with a kind of disposition towards the world, not a blind disposition, no. in fact, a very seeing one that is open enough. And you always have to take a risk. And that risk is that, it, as you do in love, that it may be rejected and you may be very hurt, but nothing is achieved without making a risk. And the trouble with the models we have by which we lead our lives, including our business lives, our social lives, our intellectual lives, is that we can have a risk-free existence. I mean, yeah. it, it, that's the fantasy. And that ev every kind of danger and risk should be annihilated. But we don't have near enough danger and risk in our lives. If it was more, we'd start to live properly. Um, and you see this in cultures and people who have actually had to face real risks yeah. and dangers. What happens in our culture is because a lot of people really don't have any experience of it, we invent all kinds of risks and dangers to which we are vulnerable and from which we must be protected. This is a very bad way to approach life. Yes, I agree with that very deeply. I think our culture is pursuing security at the expense of Sophia in some pretty profound Absolutely. ways. I, I, when, when you were talking about that reciprocal thing, and it made me think in your, uh, of in your, the book, the distinction you make from between presencing and representing, because presence oh, yeah. is that kind of knowing in which I'm opening, I'm opening up to your presencing as opposed to forming a representation of you. And that's, that's very. That's what I meant about the perspectival knowing is governed by a normativity of presence as opposed to a normativity of conviction. Uh, so when yes, I get no, that, no. you can see that actually in, in of all things, uh, cognitive scientists, we have to look for interesting case studies. But when you, when you see in VR, virtual reality, what people are actually looking for. And, and here's what you might think is like, well, what, because they, what they crave is a sense, a sense of presence. People, that's the normative standard, by the way. If I get a sense of being in the game, that makes it a really good game. And you might think, well, it's verisimilitude. It's verisimilitude that gen generates a sense of presence, right? No, no, it's not. It's neither necessary nor sufficient. What generates a sense of presence is that reciprocal opening. So you can get it in things like Tetris because you can get into the flow state. Right. Yeah. So, right. Again, we get locked into uh, a certain, you know, representational purity, if you'll allow me that word. And we lose, right, we lose the continual emergence of presencing, which I think is much more crucial to meaning making and to wisdom cultivation. Well, that distinction between presencing and representation is fundamental to my Mm -hmm. philosophy and my view of the difference between the right hemisphere to which things present and the left hemisphere which carries a representation. Yes. And it's not far from Korzybski's idea of the map and the territory. Yes. Yes. And we mistake our map, our theoretical construct, for the territory that it maps. And that is a huge mistake. Um, I, I, I don't know if you uh, have read the bit where I talk about the the experiment where people were asked to about the truth or otherwise of syllogisms um the porcupine is a monkey did i did i talk have you read that bit i'm probably familiar with it because i'm uh i haven't read that book in your book uh, bit in your book but it, i'm it, sure it, I'm, I'm familiar with it, the logic it's and, Deglin and Kins, but they did this wonderful study in which subjects had one hemisphere at a time knocked out uh, um, and and then they ask them about the truth of a syllogism. And the, the syllogism, of course, is, as you know, that there is two premises, a mm -hmm. statement that's true, another statement that's true, and then something that follows from it. But there was a catch. In each case, one of the premises was not true. And so they asked people to say, is the conclusion correct? And to cut a long story short, 
when the brain was intact and when the right hemisphere alone was operating, if one of the statements that led to the conclusion was clearly false, they said, no, the conclusion is wrong. But in the left hemisphere state, even if one of the premises was clearly wrong, contrary to all their experience, they said the conclusion was correct because that's what it says on this piece of paper. Now, that seems staggeringly resonant to me because I live in a world, you know, working in hospitals where what's on the piece of paper is more important than what's actually happening between me and the patient, according to the managerial culture in which one operated. And I'm sure the same thing happens in universities and, you know, any big organization. Totally. And so you may know about this research uh, where you take uh, studies in cognitive science, in cognitive neuroscience that can't get published. You don't change them other than putting in an fMRI picture of a brain. You resubmit them, and then they get accepted for publication. Um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that's very important. Um, so I'm wondering, I, 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 I feel like I have a bit of a responsibility here, um, and uh, perhaps you share it, because you did point to it earlier. You do talk about, and you try to emphasize, and you brought it up, uh, a few minutes ago, that it's not the case that, you know, um, the right hemisphere is the right way to go or something like that. It's a dynamic integration of the two. Um, yeah. uh, because I'm thinking of Jill Bolte Taylor's book, My Stroke of Insight. I don't know if you've read it. I mean, I I do. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, she has the hemorrhage in the left hemisphere. It gets traumatized. It basically shuts down and everything shifts into the right hemisphere. And that's not a wonderful existence either, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's pretty horrific. Um, what's interesting, of course, is she slowly recuperates. What I found particularly yeah. interesting is she she retains the ability because the, the the rehabilitation was when she was had full explicit awareness. She can she can step to the right. She claims whenever she needs yeah. to. She can sort of uh, introspectively or interceptively shift activation into the right. Uh, she retained that as kind of a superpower from her trauma, um, which I yeah. thought was really interesting. Yeah. She says it's transformed her life, you know, and that yeah. she's able to go into this this place, or at least to see it. What we need to do is is see that the left hemisphere is a very good servant, but a very poor master, yeah. and that is the that is the problem. I'm just going to say that again because it came up as a connection unstable. Please. What we need to see is that, that yeah, yeah. What, what we need to see is that the left hemisphere is a. A, a very good servant, but a very poor master. And I believe that we've moved to the position where we only attend to what this poor servant <laughs> or good servant um, is telling us uh, as if it were the master. And we're ignoring what it is that our right hemisphere knows. In fact, we're being trained to ignore it. Do you know Christopher Alexander, the, the architect and, and thinker? He, he, fantastic. No, uh, Anyway, back in the 60s, he did an experiment at Radcliffe with a lot of, you know, highly intelligent, highly educated young women. And he asked them to assemble a series of strips of black and white stripes in any way they liked. And effectively, what interested him was that there are two ways of doing it. One is by a linear sequential way of thinking. The other is by a kind of gestalt vision in which you see that certain things go together to make patterns. And he thought that, you know, there might be a 50-50 about it, but that actually being highly intelligent, they would naturally go for the gestalt approach because it's more the way in which we can understand natural phenomena, anything from the growth of a fetus to the growth of a spiral nebula. In science, what one is doing is seeing patterns and understanding them, not just plodding down a line of reasoning. Anyway, 80% of them grouped them in a totally serial way. And, you know, his question is, well, why? And I guess that it's the way in which we're taught to think. We're taught it's not smart to pay attention to intuitions and imagination. It's only smart to keep your nose on that thing and keep plodding on. Right. I think that's deeply important. Yeah, it would be great to, I think we're kind of getting towards the, the, the time on this call. So it'd be fantastic if either of you have any kind of uh, threads that you wanted to kind of tie off before we, we end this edition? I guess what's foremost in my mind is I, I, would, li I would love to do this again. Um, I found this, I found yeah. that there's enough common ground, uh, but there's enough variation that we're, we're, there's excellent discussion happening here. I found it, well, I found reciprocal opening occurring. And, That's it. 
Thank you. I, I really like I, I was going to say to David, um, I'm better at opening up than closing down. I don't know how to close this conversation down. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from just closing your laptop and walking away, but that that would be that would be rude, and I know you wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, no. So, so, so what I, can we I, do? I would like to. Uh, th there was a question that I was thinking about at the beginning, and I'm I'm sure it's one that I've asked John before, and I've I've heard him talk about, but I'm not sure I've heard. But I, I was thinking I'd love to hear your answer to this, Ian. Do you have a definition of wisdom? What is wisdom for you? Okay. Um. I think the difficulty with wisdom is that no wise person will no. tell you what it is or how to achieve it. Mm -hmm. It's one of those paradoxical things. It's like if you really understand or begin to understand God, you don't understand God. And, and you know, Augustine said, well, if you understand, then you haven't understood. Uh, and I think wisdom falls into that category, which is why I'm a little bit suspicious of studying wisdom in the lab. <laughs> uh, how can you? It can't be produced, uh, you know, to order. It can't be measured. And there aren't that many people who get it. It's rather like, you know, if people say to me, how do I get wisdom? It's a bit like asking me, um, how do I get less self-conscious? Uh, a very difficult question to answer because all the methods I will give you will make you self-conscious about it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, but I think it's something you recognize when you see it. And I think it's as much about a way of being as anything else. Yeah, In fact, it is a way of being. It's certainly not a knowledge or an absence of knowledge or anything to do with knowledge. It's a kind of approach to the world that can only come with experience, probably only comes with a certain amount of suffering, and comes from a lot of self-examination. Um, and anybody who claims it hasn't got it. So I, I agree with Ian on that. I mean, I think the, the pragmatic uh, self-contradiction aspect of wisdom, McGee and Barber commented on this a long time ago in the 1990 paper that uh, a sure mark of somebody not being wise is make, uttering the statement I'm wise. Um, so I, I agree with that. Um, and, I, I, and I sort of agree with the Platonic um, argument that we are always philia Sophia. We're always, we are always joint lovers of wisdom. We're in dialogue together, uh, affording a mutual aspiration, a mutual love, and we're trying to get into that reciprocal opening, that ongoing conformity. Um, and so I, I do think that there are aspects, uh, I think it's like uh, studying love in the lab. You can't study love in the lab uh, because you can't just sort of bring people in and say, okay, now do it, love, right? I get that. But I mean, you can, you can, so what you can do is you can study components that seem to, I'm trying to use a word here that won't tie me too much to the mechanistic framework that you dislike in, but you can study sort of components or factors like I did earlier about how reciprocal opening tends to engender people coming into a state of love. So you can study the processes, right, and the, and, the, and the constellation of processes that seem to not produce statements of I'm wise, because I agree with you. But people do say, and they get, and they, and they do it with good reason and evidence and intersubjective agreement, I am wiser than I was. And you, I, I'm interested in what, when people say that, and what are they talking about, and what has happened. And I agree with you. They don't typically mean I have now acquired theory X or theory Y or even skill Y. And you can see all the platonic dialogue shooting all of those, all of those accounts of wisdom down. No, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. Instead, what they seem to do is they seem to point to, well, again, some of the things that I think we were both discussing, you know, getting a proper, you know, a dynamic integration between left and right, and also what we were exemplifying in this kind of reciprocal opening and the idea of trying to bring in multiple perspectives, get them talking to each other, not necessarily pursuing logical coherence, but pursuing something like, much more like dialogical reciprocity. And so I, that's how I study it. I study it, for example, you know, with, with people who have mystical experiences. Do they find that they're more aware in their life of patterns of self-deception than control groups? 
These are questions, of course, you can study scientifically. They're not going to give me the essence of wisdom. That's kind of a ridiculous thing. But they may give me, if you'll allow me, they may give me a theory of how I, I, in fact, explicitly argue that you can only have a process theory of wisdom. You can't have a product theory. You, you sort of shouldn't try to tell me what the product looks like, but you can tell me a lot about the process of becoming wise. And that's what I'm very much interested in. Well, I, you know, I was just actually going to say wisdom isn't a thing, it's a process. And it's yeah. never ending. So yes, very much. Never and a lot of the journey is about undoing things that you were certain of before. Exactly. So, I mean, actually, just not to avoid completely having anything to say about what could be a path to wisdom. It would be my favorite Zen saying, yes, but. Uh, and if only the conversations that become so acrimonious and so simplistic and extreme on the internet were couched with yes, but. And um, in a world in which we don't have yes, but, you appear, you are cursed as an extremist of another kind. If you show any hesitancy in accepting a certain position, you yeah. are suddenly cursed as a polar opposite. Yeah, yeah. But all the interesting conversations go on in the area of hesitancy. And actually, a, a, a philosopher that I, I knew, liked, and greatly admired, Roger Scruton, died not long yeah. ago. And... Yeah. Uh, when he was asked about the essence of philosophy, I think he said hesitancy. So I, I you know, I think that's a good one. <laughs> well, I mean, I, to, to pick up on your point, I think we've dropped too much into adversarial processing and to pick up something you emphasize in your book and I emphasize in my work, we've lost opponent processing. We've lost the idea that we can come at things from opposite angles, but we can be mutually committed to a process of mutual self-correction rather than victory over the other. And I think that's what I would be trying to move towards. I, I feel like we're opening too. up wonderful Very topics. Good point. Well, the, 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 the <laughs> keep us going you. for another two hours or so. Um, <laughs> this, has been a, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you both for making the time and for, for, for showing us the process of kind of thinking in real time. It was really beautiful to watch, so thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you so much, Ian. I, I, it has been a great pleasure, uh, a really thank great you. pleasure. I hope at some point we can repeat it. As the tech revolution continues to destroy old media, the internet is fueling a new intellectual awakening. Television made people look stupider than they were. It turns out that people are smarter with longer attention spans than we thought. I'm a journalist and filmmaker. For many years I made documentaries for the likes of the BBC and Channel 4. But I don't think the mainstream media can provide the level of analysis and insight we need for the extraordinary times we're going through, where the old structures that made sense of the world break down. It's like we're entering, just entering into the underworld and it's a descent. We're feeling everything starting to shake and the centre cannot hold. And when our ways of thinking break down, it's the rebels and the renegades who dare to think differently who are needed to reboot the system. Right, and so what's happening is that people are perceiving, because it's becoming increasingly obvious, that all of these artifacts of the way that we've gone about doing civilization are breaking down and failing in a way that is no longer easy to pretend isn't happening. And so as a consequence, this triggers a deep visceral sense. And that's a good thing, right? Because that deep visceral sense is the return to the unliminal the return to the mystery. The shift that we are on the precipice of is not like the shift from the dark ages to the enlightenment. It's like more like a shift from single cell to multicellular life. These are the people and ideas rebel wisdom is searching out to try to make sense of the growing chaos. The evolution screwed up. It handed us the tools to recognize that we don't have to value the game that it is playing and that we can now repurpose the hardware to something that's actually worthwhile. That's what I actually have hope in, is that if, if enough people can come to that realization, then, then we wake up, and not in some bullshit evangelical megachurch kind of way of being born again, but in a, in a truly initiatory way, being born again of like, I know my purpose, I know my part and I'm willing to practice resurrection. I'm willing to offer my life fully and freely, in love, in every moment. And then we're invincible. Like then we can turn things on a dime. It's also about trying to create a new form of conversation, one based on genuine dialogue, letting go of ideology, 
and fixed ideas. So we want to be a place that hosts this new form of conversation, both online and at our events. Check out our films, join the conversation, and to get early access to some great films and exclusive content, please consider supporting us on Patreon.